Good evening, everybody. Praise the Lord. Uh, we'd like to welcome you to Abundant Life International family and all you lovely friends. It's going to be a Bible study on the book of Revelation as we continue. Uh, this is the third week that we are into and uh, we are doing uh, really the title is The End is Near. And we spoke about uh, three parts. Part one was chapter one, and uh, part two was chapters two and three, and part three was from chapter four to the very end, chapter 22. Okay, so we will just have a quick recap, and uh, we will look at these uh, uh, presentations, these slides. And uh, then we'll uh, move into uh, the preparation for the rapture. Shall we pray? Our loving Father, we truly want to thank you for this wonderful opportunity through the high technology of Zoom Cloud that we could meet and we could reach out to one another in love in exhortation, in this lovely teaching, diving into the book of Revelation. We come at this time and this hour of teaching into your holy hands. Take away all distractions and give us a listening heart that we would hear your spoken word and build up faith and truly get ready for your imminent return. Bless this time, we pray. We plead the blood of Jesus over our ears, over our mind, and over all the areas that we are living in. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So, uh, friends, we are going to look into the recap of what we did the previous two weeks very quickly. We look, first of all, at the first chart, and that is Christ amidst the candlesticks. We saw chapter one talking about the introduction of uh, uh, an encounter with John himself, and the wonderful glorified Christ. And um, we also continue with the details of the glorified Christ in verses 9 to 20. So we saw John's vision. We heard the great voice of the Alpha and Omega, even as John was on the Isle of Patmos on the Lord's Day, caught up in the spirit. And then we see the seven candle stakes and uh, Christ walking in the midst of the candle stakes, and, uh, which are the seven churches. And uh, the Son of Man was also holding in his right hand the seven stars, speaking of the seven messengers, the seven angels, the seven pastors, the seven leaders of the respective churches. And there is an reassurance from the Lord himself that he holds the keys to hell and death. Praise the Lord. So we do not have to fear because there is life forevermore. When we are in Christ, though we are dead, yet shall we live forevermore. Praise the Lord. And then God instructs John to write all these things that he witnesses so that it could be read by all of us for the next 2,000 years. Christ commands John to record his revelation of the things to come. So here we see a wonderful uh, portion of the glorified Christ. Amen. And uh, we now look into the second part, 
and we see the seven churches in Asia Minor, now in present Turkey. And the Isle of Patmos was uh, just opposite these seven cities. Okay. And uh, the seven churches of Revelation that we looked at were Ephesus, a backsliding church, and then Smyrna, a steadfast church, and which was persecuted, did not receive any criticism from the Lord. Thank God. Then we saw Pergamos, a licentious church, and then Thyatira, a lax pagan church, Sardis, a dead church, and Philadelphia, wonderful, a favored church, again, with no criticism. Praise the Lord. The baptism of suffering and the baptism of love did not bring any criticism from the Lord. And we come to the seventh church, and that is Laodicea. And uh, it's a lukewarm church and the end time church, the apostate church. Okay, then we move to the second slide. And uh, we look at the seven churches compared to church history. And we saw Ephesus from 70 AD into 170 AD. It was the apostolic church uh, founded by Apostle Paul. And um, we see all the early church being on fire for the Lord. But finally, they left their first love, they fell from their first love, and they stopped doing their first works. We move on to Smyrna, the second church. It was from 170 AD to 312 AD. It was the underground church speaking about martyrdom, and we thank God. For them, even as they stood firm in the faith, going through all of the first death, being persecuted for Christ's sake. We come to the third church, Pergamos, from 312 AD to 606 AD. And it was a compromising church uh, run by the state. So uh, it was really married together. And uh, then uh, comes the fourth church, Thyatira, from AD 606 into the tribulation. This was the papal church, and uh, Emperor Constantine really took on the reins and um, compromised with the system and brought in a lot of paganism and idolatry into the papal church and there was the doctrine of Jezebelism and then we move on to the fifth church it's Sardis and uh, uh, this was the remnant that remained and came out of the papal church it was a formalistic church it was a church of reformation from AD 1520, and this church will move also into the tribulation. Now we come to the sixth church, it's Philadelphia. It was, uh, it's, it speaks of brotherly love, and it's an evangelical missionary church. It's from AD 1750 right into the rapture. And uh, seventhly, we come to Laodicea, and Laodicea was the name of the wife of Antiochus, uh, Epiphanes the second, and uh, it was AD one seven five zero, and it moves into the tribulation. This was a Christless church, and it was an apostate church. The first church was an apostolic church. It was on fire for God. 
but this was an apostate church, a very cold-hearted church. The church has to survive much struggle before it is finally perfected. Despite persecution, change, and decay, the true church of Jesus Christ has survived through the steadfast faith of overcomers. Praise the name of the Lord. And for all the overcoming, Christ has promised various rewards. Glory be to God. Amen. And now we come to the third part that is uh, today. We had earlier said last week that we would go into the third part of chapters four and five, talking about the person of the judge. But I just felt that it would be very apt to talk about the rapture during this point of time, since last week we spoke from Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10, and we touched on the rapture because, for your clear understanding, this is the right point of time where the rapture will take place before chapter 4. Amen. Because in chapter 4 and verse 1, it is the Lord calling John and he says, Come up hither. Okay. But we will look right now, not at chapter 4. We will look at some of the cross references throughout scripture talking about this wonderful experience that the believers are going to enjoy, the experience called the rapture. Now, the word rapture is literally not mentioned in scriptures, just like the word called Trinity. These two words are, um, are concepts are mentioned in order to understand the teaching and the doctrine uh, uh, of the event that would take place, especially rapture. Trinity is uh, explaining the mystery of the Godhead, the hidden truth of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, rapture is a mystery of God talking about the catching up of God's people, literally, that they would be transformed in the twinkling of an eye. Hallelujah. The metamorphosis that will take place, just like a caterpillar moving into the cocoon and then coming out as a beautiful, multicolored, flying butterfly. Amen. And so let us look at um, John's vision. Amen. And uh, we, we will see uh, the rapture. Okay. Now, the first part we can look at is the escape from the coming tribulation. Now, when we look at the escape from the coming tribulation, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10 talks about not going through the hour of trial. This is the seven-year tribulation. Now, when I did my thesis on the book of Revelation on eschatology, what I really felt was um, that um, I would uh, study all the three uh, doctrines or schools of thought. That is, firstly, the pre-tribulation rapture. That is when the rapture takes place before the seven-year tribulation. The second theory is mid-tribulation rapture where the rapture would take place 
three and a half years after the seven year tribulation would begin. So really midway, the rapture would take place according to some uh, people believe. The third area would be the post tribulation rapture that is after the seven years. Now this theory is certainly uh, not holding any water. But the mid-tribulation also, when you examine it closely, it's, uh, it's seen that um, very often it's pulled out of context because uh, God is also speaking to the Jews in the book of Matthew chapter 24. And so we need to be very clear. And uh, looking at cross-references, uh, we come to the clear-cut conclusion that it's going to be a pre-tribulation rapture. This is even after consultations with mighty men of God all over the world in my travels and even in meeting with them. So praise God, let's move into this area of escape from the coming tribulation. Now, not all of those living in the end times will have to suffer the horrors of God's wrath upon an evil, corrupt world and upon his rebellious children, the Israelites. Now, we have this blessed hope that will keep purifying us that God is the one by his spirit who is going to bring deliverance to the remnant of people. Those are the godly believers in Christ Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. So we see in Luke 21 verses 18 and 28. But there shall not a hair of your head perish. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draw it nigh now definitely some will escape some of us will definitely escape and all of you who are believers in christ have the full assurance that you are going to be caught up in this wonderful rapture flight number seven boarding to heaven so we are exhorted to watch and pray. Christ emphasized the need to be ever vigilant and to pray without ceasing for deliverance. We should keep short accounts of our sins with God. Therefore, we shouldn't go into this high grace teaching where you have to only believe that you are already forgiven and it's all over but remember when we are living this life on a day-to-day -day basis we do fall short and it is important not to beat the dead horse but coming afresh to the throne of his grace to obtain mercy in the hour of need and to confess our sins believing in our hearts for god to forgive us and to receive the cleansing by the blood of Jesus. In this way, we are maintaining and working out our salvation in fear and trembling. We are working out. Amen. We need to work out on a daily basis this wonderful salvation, which is a free gift given by grace through faith, through our Lord Jesus Christ alone. Hallelujah. And so it says in Luke 21, verse 36, Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. This verse is so clear that we will not have to go through the seven year great tribulation. The true church is going to be trusting in Christ. Christ speaking to his beloved church, which is the real body of Christ. 
promised protection for all of those who really trust him. We are, pro we are provided with his shield, his blood protection, even during this pandemic of COVID-19. So, church, fret not, faint not, and fear not. I repeat it. Faint not, fret not, and fear not, but have faith. And we will go through victoriously. Amen. Revelation 3.10 says, Because thou hast kept the word, I also will keep thee from the hour or the hour of trial in some translations which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell it upon the earth. Hallelujah. Even in this pandemic, I do not believe that we are in the seven-year tribulation. No way. In fact, we are, to a certain extent, in comfort zone. We are in our own homes. We have a quality time with the Lord. We have a quality time with the family. The earth is getting detoxed. We, uh, we have, we have uh, some uh, discomforts. Fine. We are not meeting. That's the saddest part. But it is not the seven-year tribulation that has begun. This is only a trailer. It is only a rehearsal of things to come. So even concerning this vaccine that is coming up and all the WhatsApp messages and all the YouTube messages going around about the vaccine connected with uh, uh, Bill Gates and uh, even uh, uh, some of the cronies around in the world. Uh, we we do not want to just mention names, but we just want to say that uh, you do not have to really worry about this uh, vaccine. Basically, vaccines are, are inoculations, and you've seen it in the past, in school days. We've taken it on the arm, right, uh, where the muscles are. And uh, or you're taking it on your buttons, but um, the Bible talks about the chip being inserted in your right hand or on your head. So even if there is a chip that they are trying to, um, uh, you know, insert into people, I don't think this is the chip of the antichrist because when it's going to be the chip of the antichrist it is going to be done um very systematically and uh, somehow when you get it there is no reversing right and um once you take the mark of the beast you are destined for the lake of fire you are destined for hell so, I would encourage you, you, do not fear. Keep trusting in the Lord. We'll take one day at a time. Now, the Bible also saved Noah and his family. God counted Noah to be righteous by faith. Amen. Noah and his family were saved. The only family that was saved in his time all were destroyed because during this time there was a genetic engineering that took place supernaturally. We see even the fallen angels leaving their first estate and coming to the daughters of men and producing 
giants producing hybrids, half fallen angels and half human. These were like monsters. And uh, this was against the genetic code. And God was very angry. He had to destroy the whole world, including animals and birds. But he had preserved a certain set of animals and birds and insects and Noah's family. And God saved them in the ark. Just as in the days of Noah, so will be this end time. So will be this time preceding the rapture. Right now, there are very many wicked, ungodly men, even Nephilim, even Satanists, who are tampering with the genetics of man. And so we have all these kind of things that are taking place. And uh, yet we do not know what is happening behind the scene. Right now, we look at even Lot. God was merciful at Lot and his family. And he made an attempt to save them. But out of six, there were only three that were saved, 50%. When we look at um, the scriptures, two were in bed. One was caught up, the other left behind. Two in the field, one caught up, the other left behind. You see the ten virgins, five with oil in their lambs, make it, making it through the door, making it through Jesus. Hallelujah, the door. And five virgins were left behind. They did not have oil in their lambs. They were not filled with the Holy Spirit. Again, 50%. So we see that um, things are very uh, precarious and we have to be watching and praying. We have to be alert during this time. God has always made sure that his true and obedient servants were taken to safety before visiting great catastrophes on the earth he still will before this great catastrophe of the second uh, of the seven year tribulation in second peter chapter 2 verses 5 to 9 it says spared not the old world but saved noah bringing in the flood upon the ungodly turned sodom and gomorrah into ashes and delivered just just lot the lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations amen it says the word of god says that the lord jesus christ yahoshua will come as a thief in the night in first thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 6 it says watch and be sober when you are sober it means you are not intoxicated with strong drink remember when we are caught up with this world we are intoxicated with the influence of the world and so to say we cannot watch we are blinded and we are drunk with the wine of this world now christ wants us to stay alert and spiritually prepared because when he comes for his people he will come like a thief in the night to snatch up his precious pearl his precious pearl is his beautiful bride the church a pearl is formed when there the organism goes living organism goes through excruciating excruciating pain amen with a grain of sand 
entering into the oyster. It is like Jesus was imputed with our sin, the sin of the whole world, and all those who believe in his sacrifice become the bride of Christ. Amen. And Christ had to go through pain to bring forth this beautiful pearl that he's looking forward for. Amen. Revelation 16, verses 15, and then chapter 3, verse 3, it says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watch it and keep it. He walk naked and they see his shame. Who are they? See his shame. The ungodly people will see his shame. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come to thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come. Amen. So we should never be left behind. Amen. We should be watchful, sober, and alert. We are children of the light, and we know the season of the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then we see the Lord's shout. We hear. And the Lord says, come up hither. The Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, but only they who are spiritually awake and ready will hear him. The wicked and those Christians who are dozing will not. So let us be awake spiritually. Amen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17 says, For the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, and the dead shall rise first. Then we which are alive shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Hallelujah. The trump of God is like the last reveal. The French word called reveal, which is a wake up sound. It's like the bugle sounding, and it's a morning signal um, to awake the soldiers in the barracks and in the camp, in the soldiers' camp. I believe the trumpet will sound to wake us up and to take us uh, to be with Him. A trumpet will also sound from heaven. This is not a physical sleeping because some will be asleep in certain parts of the world, maybe uh, towards the west. If we take Jerusalem time as the center of the earth, then God is always referring to Jerusalem time, the world capital. Amen. His capital for the world. Hallelujah. Amen. But finally, it'll be New Jerusalem. But Jerusalem time, and we see to the west, it will be the sleeping hours of the night. But towards the east in Asia, it will be the daytime. So two will be working. It could be in the field. So, well, it is Asia, and then two in bed asleep. It could be the West. Well, in Jerusalem time, it will be before dawn. Wow! 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 Hallelujah! Jesus fulfilled all the seven feasts. Amen. And it's going into the second uh, range of prophetic mountains and so he is fulfilled um, the first three feasts that is the feast of the Passover his crucifixion 
and then we look at the unleavened bread. He was the sinless sacrifice. He was buried. The Athokomen, the bread, uh, slipped under the third uh, layer of the napkin. After three days, Jesus rose from the dead. The first fruits. So all that is the death, burial, resurrection. Fifty days later, we see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. And we see the birth of the church of Jesus Christ, uh, uh, the 120 in the upper room. Hallelujah. That too was fulfilled. And then there is a long gap. And then we have the three feasts, the Feast of Trumpets. Amen. This is the day of the rapture. Rosh Hoshanah. Hallelujah. The second new year of the Jews in one calendar year. Amen. And then we see also, praise the Lord, um, the Day of Atonement, speaking of uh, uh, the seven-year tribulation, where God sovereignly uh, began with uh, Israel as a nation. He's going to end with the nation of Israel in the seven-year tribulation. So he's going to take them up. He's going to save them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And all of Israel is going to be saved during the seven-year tribulation. Amen. Atonement, just like he's made the church one with him in his atoning sacrifice. He's going to make the Jews one with him in that um, substance of atonement, in that feast time, in reality, in the seven-year great tribulation. And then we see... Uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, and we see the ushering after the second coming of the Lord with the church um, as the clouds around him, and he's coming on a white horse. He will come to establish his kingdom here on earth. Wow! Praise the Lord, and it will usher in 1,000 years of the reign of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Adonai, Yahoshua, a Mashiach ruling here on earth with Satan bound and put into the bottomless pit. And we're going to talk about all those interesting things about the great tribulation and about the millennial rule and reign of Christ and whatever it's coming in the coming weeks. So you just get ready to receive and to be blessed and share it with others. Amen. Even the video that you will receive, please share it with others freely. Give it out. This is uh, the alarm. Amen. To awake the church and to save the world. Hallelujah. So a trumpet will also sound from heaven, sounding the reveal for all believers dead and all uh, the, those who would arise from the dead, but together with those living to be caught up with the Lord in the air. Hallelujah. They would escape from this tribulation. First Corinthians fifteen fifty seven says, For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Amen. In verse 52. But thanks be to God, which give us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now in preparation, we move quickly on to the next slide. That is Christ raptured saints in heaven. What will happen? After being taken up, Christ's people will be assessed on their earthly performance in a purification by fire before being presented as his bride. This is the mystery of the church, the true church, the body of Christ being caught up in the rapture. Hallelujah. And the mystery is the hidden truth. But when we diligently seek God with all our hearts and search scriptures, rightly dividing the word of truth, 
we will find. He says, seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened unto you. We will seek the face of the Lord. We will search scriptures and we will find the golden nuggets God has for us. The beautiful pearls. Amen. And after being taken up, Christ's people will be assessed on their earthly performance in a purification by fire before being presented as his bride. This is a cleansing. This is a purification. And uh, church, we really need to get ready. It's going to be exciting. There's coming up a judgment. We will talk about different kinds of judgments that are there. But right now, the present judgment, as I shared a little earlier uh, in the earlier weeks, is the judgment when you allow God's written word to judge you as it comes alive by the spoken word, the Logos becoming the Rhema word, and uh, the Holy Spirit quickens the word of God. When God is speaking to us, here, if you have years, hear what the Spirit of God has to say to the church. See what God has to say to you as an individual. We did about um, uh, in the theme of work uh, earlier uh, that we need to examine. Every individual needs to examine their work to see if it is of God. And those works, good works, will bring your rewards okay so allow the living uh, allow the written word to judge you right now uh, and you will not be judged so we are going after the rapture to a judgment not to be judged whether we are saved or not this is a judgment for the saved for the born again believers but what's going to be judged our works we're going to take with us all our works we cannot take Anything else, we cannot take our loved ones with us unless they make the, the, their personal decision for the Lord. We cannot take our properties or personal belongings. No way. We can only take our works with us. So there's going to be uh, Christ's judgment, the judgment seat of Christ, or the Bema um, judgment. Or it's a judgment whereby one will be rewarded and no one is going to be punished. But if you do not receive your rewards, you will be saved, but highly disappointed and going through a loss and no profits. So, after being raptured, Christ's saints must now appear before his seat of judgment. However, this is not the great white throne judgment which will take place after the millennial rule and reign of Christ. Amen. So, um, we look at 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body. Amen. And then. Um, these are works, good works. They can be spiritual or worldly. The saints will be judged, not for sin, but for the good spiritual works and the dead fleshly works they did during their Christian lives on earth. Certainly, all are seemingly good works before being born again before our spirits were regenerated our spirits were dead so whatever we produced were dead works death cannot produce life amen so those were all dead works that we did before we were born again but yet god is a just god god is a loving god don't fear trust god and he is going to give us his rewards remember remember that uh, according to that thing that he has done whether it be good or bad amen second corinthians 5 10 now it's going to be reward or loss 
Christ will hear me more an umpire than a judge. And according to their performance, the saints will receive reward or suffer loss or merit. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that he may obtain. 1 Corinthians 9.24 Here we are not competing with anybody else. We are competing with ourselves. So we must be better off today than we were last year or last month or last week. We need to mourn from faith to faith, strength to strength, victory to victory, glory to glory, and grace to grace. Amen. Hallelujah. And so our works will be tried by fire. Amen. First Corinthians 3.13 Every man's work shall be made manifest. It shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Either they will come forth as gold, silver, and precious stones, or hay, wood, and stubble. It will be burnt up. Now, it's just like a factory owner. He owns uh, the whole factory. He has worked hard all his life. For 50 years to build this beautiful factory. And one day as he's coming in as Mercedes Benz towards his factory, he sees it all burnt up in smoke. Now, he is saved as an individual life because he's not in that factory getting burnt up. But he's alive and he can see what's happening. He's going through pain and excruciating loss. For all his labor in his life. It's similar to that. If we do not have good works, then all our works, our fleshly deeds, all our worldly works are going to be burnt by the judgment fire of God. Amen. The Holy Ghost fire is going to burn it all up and it's going to turn into ashes. And we will go through a loss, but we will be saved. But if they come forth as gold, silver, and precious stones, we will have wonderful treasure in heaven. And we will have an attire that will be so beautiful for eternity. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. There are going to be five golden crowns. The crown of life, according to Revelation 2.10. There's going to be the crown of glory. According to 1 Peter 5, 1 to 4, there's going to be the crown of rejoicing. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. There's going to be the crown of righteousness. According to 2 Timothy uh, and 4, 18. And there's going to be the crown incorruptible. According to 1 Corinthians 9, 25 to 27. Amen. The losers will not be cast out. Amen. The winners, those works survive the trial, will be awarded golden crowns, but those who emerge with nothing will not be punished or cast out. If any man's work abide, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, be he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Amen. And uh, then we see the Lamb's marriage feast. We are going to be married. Right now we are only engaged to the Lord, but we are engaged to be married. And we go to be with the Lord, and we are married to the Lord by the Father. And here... It's so wonderful. Amen. We see the marriage feast, the bride of Christ. Now that his bride, the true church, is finally cleansed, purified, and perfected without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. Hallelujah. The Christian can accept her. Uh, Christ can accept her as his very own and make her truly part of himself. Ephesians 5.27 that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that 
but it should be holy and without blemish. And then we see his glorious return with the church, his saints. Amen. Hallelujah. That's the final return. Amen. In Revelation 22, 4 to 5, and they shall see his face and his name shall be in their foreheads. Hallelujah. Those who do not take the mark of the beast, they will have God's name in their forehead. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mind you, during the tribulation, millions of Gentiles too are going to be saved. As they become martyrs, we will come to that. But all of Israel also is going to be saved. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Now we move on quickly to the final um, slide. The rapture of the Lord's people. Okay. The translation to heaven of those who truly belong to Christ. Before, before the great tribulation falls upon the world. Amen. According to Christ's promise, Christ has promised us in John 14, verses 2 and 3, about the heavenly mansions, the many mansions, the large mansions he has prepared for us. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, they are, they may be also. Amen. Christ promised to prepare homes in heaven for his people and that he would come back to receive those who believe unto himself. We are taken to safety, meeting with the Lord. It is not God's desire that any true Christian should have to endure the coming tribulation. So Christ will translate them out of harm's way. Hallelujah. Mark 13, 32 and 33. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels which are in heaven. Neither the Son, but the Father. Take ye heed, watch and pray. For ye know not when the time is. Hallelujah. Those who will be caught up in the rapture, will be taken by the Lord, will be the born-again Christians. That is why Jesus in John chapter 3 spoke to Nicodemus very clearly. You must be born again. It's not an option. You must be born again. Then only will you see the kingdom. Then only will you enter into the kingdom. And you will be born again by water and the Spirit of God. Water is not water baptism, although that must follow. But water is the water of God's Word. So God's Word and the Spirit of God will cause you to be convicted of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And you repent in response and receive Jesus Christ into your heart. As your personal Lord and Savior, He steps right into you, and your holy and the Holy Spirit regenerates your spirit, and you are born again. All of those who have truly accepted Christ, repented of their sins, and been born again at the time of the rapture, will go whether dead or alive. John three. 5 and 7. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Must be born again. Hallelujah. About the ten virgins, there were oil in the lambs. Amen. In the, in the parable of the ten virgins, Christ warned his followers to always be filled with the oil of the Holy Spirit in readiness for His coming. Being filled with the Holy Spirit or baptized in the Holy Spirit is not an option. 
It is meant for every born again Christian in order to be empowered by the Spirit and then do the works of God. Hallelujah. Matthew 25, 8 and 13. And the foolish said, give us of your oil for our lamps have gone out. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Remember, we need to trim our lamp wicks. Amen. Trimming speaks of an ongoing repentance so that we would be sharp and shapen by the Lord himself, that our lights would be bright. And so, behold a mystery. Amen. First Corinthians 15, 51 and 52. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the, at the last trumpet. Hallelujah. For the trumpet will sound. How will it be possible to be taken to heaven alive? Without actually dying. Enoch and Elijah were both translated alive. They were raptured to heaven. Amen. So there are some who will not taste of the first death. Like Elijah and Enoch. Amen. We have put on immortality. We shall be changed from mortality to immortality. The bodies of both the dead and the living will be changed into a new, imperishable, immortal body uh, instantly at the time of the rapture. First Corinthians fifteen fifty three, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed full. Amen. Perishable must put on imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. We are supposed to be salt of the earth. The we are the preserver of the earth. You put salt in food that it may be preserved. It would not rot. Now that the restraining effect of spirit-filled believers has been removed, the world without its preserving salt, quickly turns rotten. There is a decay that comes into planet Earth. There is a decay that comes into the world, and therefore the world begins to rot in the seven-year great tribulation. Matthew 5.13, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, Wherewith shall it, that is, the earth, be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out. Oh, the restraining effect of the spirit will believe us. The Holy Spirit will take the believers. The restrainer will go. Now, after the rapture, the, the Antichrist will make his appearance along with the false prophet. Right now, I believe he's living and he's a grown-up man. He's in hiding. He will be re revealed only when the Holy Spirit takes the bride of Christ away. We are right now a hindrance to the Antichrist. So we restrain him by the power of the Holy Spirit and our very testimony. Praise the name of the Lord. In closing, I want to remind you of the man called Enoch. Enoch was the seventh generation from Adam. Enoch walked with God according to Genesis chapter 5, verse 22. Okay? But verse 21 says he was the father of Methuselah. Methuselah. Now, was the oldest man 
that ever lived on record. 969 years. Wow. 31 years short of 1,000 years. You can keep those figures in mind. They are interesting. Just like Adam. 930 years. And what was left? 70 years. Amen. Praise the Lord. Okay. So, there are three Enochs, okay? Enoch is the son of Cain. That is one Enoch. Don't mix it up. The second Enoch is a city named Enoch after Cain's son. And the third Enoch is this Enoch, the father of Methuselah. He walked with God and God took him. Wow. Wow. God took him up. If you walk with God, God will take you up. Amen. It says in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 5 and 6, Enoch pleased God. Amen. If you please God, wow, God will take you up. You must be a God pleaser. It then goes on to say in verse 6 of chapter 11, for it is without faith, it is impossible to please God. And by faith, Enoch pleased God. By faith, by trusting in God, amen, you will please God. How will you get this faith? By hearing the word of God, amen. And especially hear the book of Revelation. There are added bonus blessings. Amen. And keep to that word. Glory to God. What is the meaning of Enoch? Enoch means dedicated. Amen. We must be dedicated to the Lord. The church of Jesus Christ must be dedicated to Jesus. Right from babies, we must be dedicated to the Lord. We must be dedicated to the Lord right from the time we are in the womb. Amen. Because he's ordaining us and sanctifying us in our very womb. Glory to God. And then finally, Jude 14 and 15. It says that Enoch prophesied about the myriads of saints that were coming with the Lord. The whole cloud of witnesses coming at the time of the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Church, family, friends, it's such a joy sharing with you and teaching you and we all learning together by the power of the Holy Spirit, the book of Revelation. You are going to be blessed even more get ready for the coming weeks we will be victorious in christ jesus let me pray for you our loving heavenly father i thank you for every precious listener i pray that each one of us would be sanctified and your name would be sanctified in our lives, in our spirits, souls, and bodies. That we would be restored. That we would be revival ready. We would be rapture ready. And we would be reward ready for the glory of God. Bless our people. We plead the blood of Jesus over each one of us that you would take us through this trying time victorious and we would be mighty witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. Adonai Yahoshua HaMashiach. Be blessed, you and your family and your near and dear ones. In Jesus' mighty name, yeah. amen. And God's people shout, Amen. And...
Amen.